everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, Mastering Orthopedic Implant uh, webinar series um, delivered to you by the Orthopedic Academy. I'm Firas Arnaud, the convener of this uh, program. Uh, today's session is a redo. Uh, we have uh, the pleasure again of having Mo Mr. Muhammad Al Sultani with us to redo the hip replacement um, implant session for us. Mr. Al Sultani is um, a post CCT fellow in uh, hip uh, primary and revision hip replacement. He works at the Center of Excellence, a uh, world renowned place, uh, Wrightington Hospital, where the origin of modern hip replacements uh, came from. So he's the per perfect person to be talking to us uh, this evening about um, hip replacement implants. So the session will include a short, um, well, include a lecture, quite comprehensive, but we must have a disclaimer. There's no way uh, Mr. Asultani can cover everything about hip replacement in, in a short lecture. So we focus on some of the history, some of the biomechanical concepts, but if there are any questions at all, anything else you'd like us to add, uh, in the future or cover in the future, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. At the end of the lecture, there will be a set of MCQs. Uh, so please to make sure you're all still awake with us. So without further ado, I will leave you with Mr. As-Sultani. Great. Um, good evening, all. Uh, thanks for us. A great introduction. Um, yeah, I work in writing at the moment, which is uh, you know, a pleasure. Um, and it's a pleasure for me to come and talk to you today. Um, as for us, as a recap, um, of about three weeks ago. So hopefully it'll cover as much as I can, uh, make it relevant as well. And uh, as Faraz said, any questions, I'll try and answer them at the end uh, with a few MCQ questions as well to, to, to get us going. Right, okay, so starting off, um, so just a quick sort of list of objectives. So um, always think about what, you know, what we're trying to achieve with the total hook placements, um, try and cover some of the, so the history of, of total hip replacement implants uh, give you a flavor of the developments uh, that happened in the past uh, what implants are available at the moment again get a flavor of the spectrum of implants available to any hip and knee uh, hip surgeon sorry not knee surgeon uh, how implants monitored um, as well and any sort of recent advances in future direction um, so I mean, the kind of cases that hip surgeon may be faced with when it comes to hip pathology, as you can see here, is fairly spectrum. So on, on the left here, you've got your sort of standard, I guess, uh, hip osteoarthritis with this left uh, hip joint. Uh, somebody may have had a hip fracture uh, nailed and then developed a vascular necrosis. So you can see some collapse of the femoral head and develop osteoarthritis as a result. Uh, you have someone here um, who's got... Uh, more advanced osteoarthritis um, where the femoral head is eroded even further uh, into the acetabulum um, and a lot of patients who uh, have managed over the COVID period unfortunately uh, could progress and, and develop significant arthritis over time um, because they couldn't be managed with, with, with an operation so worsened over time and then you've got patients like this this one down here which is you know a young a young individual um, who's uh, had you know dyspastic hips with, with arthritis or you know, diagnosis of like Sufi or Perthase or some sort of um, childhood condition of the hip that's then developed into early osteoarthritis as a uh, as a young adult. So that's the sort of spectrum. Um, with a hip replacement, what are you trying to achieve? So um, it is a replacement um, at the end of the day. Uh, you're trying to manage the patient's symptoms you're trying to give them pain relief is the number one aim. Um, you are needing to achieve or try and recreate the anatomy as much as possible. And the important things to look at when you assess um, a radiograph is what you start off with typically. Um, when you come to a total hip replacement, you want to be looking at certain things that you want to recreate. Um, so patient center of rotation, so the femoral head, um there are certain markers that we refer to such as the uh, femoral offset which is a distance from the center rotation to the axis of the femoral uh, canal and there's also the acetabular offset which is sort of line from the biosure line to the uh, teardrop and that's the acetabular offset so overall it's called the global offset so you you're trying to recreate the patient's 
anatomy from that sense because then it recreates the biomechanics because as well as bones you've got muscles that are attached and these are important particularly the abductor lever arm for example you've got your uh, abductors that that insert um, and you want to ensure that they remain the same sort of tension to function properly um, about around the hip joint and so you want to ensure that your offsets um, when you come to put a total hip replacement in is around the same position so these you know they're not too short you've not jacked the hip out too far which can cause pain such as trochanteric pain um, and irritation uh, laterally uh, and also when it comes to sort of uh, leg length as well you want to make sure that you uh, match well put them where they're supposed to be um, so that's that's quite key to look out for all those kind of uh, things now the the important thing when you come to look at a radiograph in particular um, when you first sort of assess patients with osteoarthritis uh, is to look at what the femoral angle is doing um, so normal angles between sort of 120, 135, less than that, sort of a varus, coxavara, uh, coxavalgus is anything above uh, 135 degrees. Now, um, you've got to be mindful when you look at the radiographs and assessing offset that you are um, looking in a correct manner because what you've got to imagine is the position of the, fe uh, the femur, the rotation will change the you know the offset that you that you can measure so to get a, a proper offset you need to really have the legs internally rotated by about 15 degrees and the idea of that is you are um ensuring that the x-ray beam is perpendicular to the femoral neck because the natural antiversion of an adult is around 15 degrees uh which and that means that, as you can see here, um, as you can see here, down here, um, 15 degree angulation of the femur anteriorly. So by internally rotating the limb, you're bringing that down to, um, to so, so the x-ray beam is perpendicular and you're getting a better representation of the patient's natural uh, offset. So, always ensure that so so for this one for example you can see more of the lesser trochanter so actually you should just be able to see the lesser trochanter in a patient with adequate internal rotation of about 15 degrees so that's something to look out for when you when you do assess a patient so things sort of started uh, in the late 19th century um and they started with uh, interpositional arthroplasty the use of you know different surface materials so people you know um covered um the, the surface of 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 the, of the femur um different such as like rubber and things like that but these obviously didn't work very well and it's not until so sort of, actually the german surgeon clock in the um around that time that first introduced the concept of total hip replacement um and used an ivory stem and a cup um, it was after that it was largely sort of forgotten about the, co the, you know, the concept of the total hip replacement and it was in the sort of 1920s and 30s that the American surgeon Smith Peterson um, sort of experimented with different materials that you can see here sort of using glass um, and metal caps that sort of covered the femur um, you know, sort of almost a bit like the sort of resurfacing, if you like. Um, so they use these metal caps, but obviously these weren't great. You know, you, you sort of covering the femoral head, uh, eroding into the acetabulum, um, glass would, you know, perspex would break. Uh, it also experimented early stages of plastic material as well, but they're, they're obviously um, also not last and fatigue. So there were sort of early stages of, of, you know, people experimenting how they can manage people with osteoarthritis. It was in the 19 sort of 40s that the French surgeon Jude um, um, sort of experimented using acrylic uh, hemiarthroplasty. So you can see here you've got sort of like a a, a perspe a, an acrylic uh, ball with a with a stem um, that be that would be sort of fixed in. So this would be hemiarthroplasty. So the socket part wouldn't be re replaced. It would just be a femoral head, and 
the, these were unfortunately prone to failure where the stem would, would fracture, uh, you know, the actual metal um, stem part of this. And it was the first um, uh, cause of a squeaky hip um, where patients would, would be heard to be squeaking with, with this uh, Jude uh, hip that was known as. It was in the 1950s that uh, surgeons Austin Moore and Frederick Thompson um, introduced their, these stems here. So the one on the left is the Austin Moore hemiarthroplasty, and the one on, on, on the right here is the Thompson's. And these are both um, just hemiarthroplasties in the sense that you only had the ball. So the patient's native socket. Um, and you know that they would articulate against against that, and and these were actually used up until recently, and I think in some places probably the Austin Moore might the Thompsons might still be used, um, for the management of patients with um neck of femur fractures. Now these were originally designed uh, to gain fixation in bone by um with Austin Moore by encouraging bone to grow through these little holes. So the Austin Moore was designed by plugging in bone here. So that you then incorporate the native uh, bone and, and, and anchor down, and you also had this sort of calcar bearing, so that will rest onto the onto the calcar part of the femur. And again, the same with the Thompsons. So this is a banana shaped stem, uh, which was tapered, and the idea was that it would get sort of lodged into the bone, and then this will bear weight onto the calcar. So that was how they were sort of anchored down. Um, then. You have these additions to them to make them sort of a total hip placement version. So you've got the Thompson's um, with this cup with a sort of spiky anchor bit that anchors into the actual uh, acetabular bone. And then the Thompson's, uh, the, the Austin Moore, sorry, you've got this sort of inverted um, ice cream cone sort of uh, that screw into the pelvis. It looks quite, you know, quite vicious. But, um, that you know, that was people's attempts at, surgeon's attempts at trying to, um, achieve a total hip replacement uh, concept but unfortunately yeah, these would fail because um, you know, there's a lot of friction, a lot of wear um, you know you had metal on metal um, and so you, know, you get a lot of metal debris uh, and soft tissue reaction and, and things wouldn't last and, and uh, deteriorate quickly so, so there's no real way up until then of securing the implant to bone it was all kind of, you know, press fit, if you like, uh, these implants in, into bone. And it was, that's where we sort of come into the era of Sir, Sir John Charlie uh, in Wrightington. And he was the, sort of the first to introduce uh, polymethyl methacrylate, which is PMMA, which is you know, bone cement um, into orthopedics. It was actually previously used by dentists, and that's how he came across it um, and introduced into the world of orthopedics and found that he can, in 1950, actually use it to uh, secure his stem in the in, in the femur. Um, and so that was a sort of introduction of a cemented um, femoral stem at that point. So he started using it. He then realised that to get... Uh, longevity and for survivorship of a hip replacement you need uh, you need to have an environment where there was very low frictional resistance and and where in the surface that was moving so the bearing surfaces so you had to have you know effortless motion between the two surfaces so that you know with less friction you're less likely then to get um particulate debris where uh, of the surfaces and therefore failure. So the longer these, you know, increased durability, the longer these surfaces will last, the longer your replacement will last. So he then realized that um, it was important to try and reduce the amount of torque transmitted from the surface, the bearing surface, onto the implant bone interface. Because if you had a lot of resistance, a lot of torque at the articular surface, at the bearing surface, sorry, then that force would be then transmitted to the implant bone interface. And that's where you would then get movement of the entire implant. It would, 
you know that 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 um, uh, interface will fail. So you can see here that um, the concept of trying to reduce the amount of talk, and you can compare how Charlie's first generation uh, stem called the flatback in 1959 the size of the austin moor um you know he he would he, he started off with the austin moor a 42 millimeter head and then he gradually reduced the head size to 28 25 and then ended up at 22.225 as the sort of most ideal head size because any smaller than that then you risk dislocation uh, so the risk of dislocation after that would sort of substantially go up. So he felt that was the optimum head size to give him the, to reduce the amount of torque, um, but also not risk increasing the risk of dislocation. So so the first flatback uh, was born in 1959. And you can see that um, the smaller head will mean that you've got a, a bigger amount of uh, acetabular cup thickness, uh, some more material, so it lasts longer because obviously it, you know, it would take longer to wear out the material. And and this would therefore reduce the amount of debris formation. Um, so, so Charlie's first stem was born in 1959, so it was the first generation. Then you had the second generation was 1974, so it's quite a big gap. Um, and this, this one, as you can see, um, had a thicker stem the idea of greater surface area um, to give it more strength uh, around the shoulder. And then the actual edges were more rounded so that there was less stress transmitted to the cement mantle um, to cause fatigue failure, especially with heavier patients. So sort of more smoother, thicker in, uh, thicker stem um, as well to, to reduce the risk of uh, fatigue failure. In 1975, he then introduced the third generation known as the, co the Cobra, um, and that was subtly different. You can see that it's got this sort of winging here over the shoulder. And the idea of that is that um, it would cause, well, it, it, it would improve the amount of weight sharing or weight, weight bearing through the cement. So the load would distribute more because the surface area would be increased, and it would reduce the risk of subsidence of the stem in the cement mantle um, on loading. So, so that was the third uh, generation. And the fourth generation um, was um, introduction of a new stainless steel alloy, uh, so the Auton 90, um, because of its greater strength, meant that um, Charlie and his engineers could reduce the actual neck diameter uh, to 10 millimeters. Um, and that reduces the relative impingement. So when you move the head in the socket, there is an impingement uh, between the neck and the edge of the socket. So by reducing the diameter of the, ne uh, of the neck, you're potentially giving an increased arc of motion from 90 to 108 before you get that impingement. So that was sort of gradual um, development of the uh, Charlie stem. So that was the Charlie stem development. But then he, um, looking at the cup side of things, so he sorted out the cement. He knew how to bind his um, stem to the bone. It's not such a glue. It's more of a grout uh, is what the cement is. He'd kind of um, sorted out or conquered the stem issue um, whilst everyone was um, looking at using large femoral heads. He was actually reducing the femoral head. People didn't understand why he was kind of doing that, but he was he was going from a slightly different, uh, you know, completely different angle, um, explaining to people that actually you need to reduce the amount of talk, um, and, and 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 argued from that point of view. And surgeon slowly came round to his idea of using um, using his concepts. Now, looking at the cup side of things, um, in the late fifties, at the same time as developing his stem. He actually used Teflon cups because Teflon, as you can imagine, um, a surface that's very sort of low, very low friction, um, worked brilliantly well initially. And he, he went on to implant about 300 odd joints, but unfortunately, um, it's not actually very durable. So although it has very low friction, 
it's not very durable and failed very quickly with massive soft tissue and bone destruction. So he had massive cohort of patients that um, unfortunately um, had significant failure um, of their cups and um, and a massive problem for Charlie, a massive headache. So it was, so at this point, it was all kind of, it was a massive setback um, for him. It was, you know, he kind of almost gave up on the idea of um, his idea of ever working. Um, he went on holiday. And then the story is that his engineer, um, Frank Wrightenson, was actually visited by um, uh, a, a rep from a company that bought this material along uh, and the high density polyethylene so he he bought this material um and with the idea of you know could this be potentially used anywhere uh no one really used it in orthopedics um frank had tested it um in his in his, in his lab and noticed that it was it was great because it had very very low friction uh the wear characteristics as well um you know it would it, it, you know the pendulum uh would go on and on and on uh when he moved this the, the actual ball and within the cup that he'd created um and it was when charlie came back from holiday that he introduced him to this material um and, and you know got charlie's attention that this is a potentially a great uh, material that we can use in the in the in the socket component of his hip replacement and that was the birth of the low frictional torque arthroplasties in 1962 um so it all kind of came together at that point um of the socket side um where he, he's got this great material high density polyethylene uh brilliant friction characteristics great wear durability he's got his small head that articulates well um is you know he's got his cement that, that bonds uh, the the actual uh, implant to, to the bone so all that sort of uh, came together at that point and over time uh there's the uh the development of, of the of the of the cups so uh you had the um the first one on on the left is your the initial high density polyethylene uh, cups that you can see um the one then in the middle, that you've got flanged, and the idea is that it creates more sort of cement pressurization. You can trim the um, trim the flange to, to to fit the socket. And the last one um, is an OG cup, which is sort of an S shaped cup. The idea is that it just it creates more um, pressurization and prevents uh, sort of debris going into the joint as well. So you can see here that this is a complete set of the Charlie. Uh, low frictional torque arthroplasty. So you've got that his cement, uh, his cement here bonding this stem. You can see the um, the cup, which is the, the wire, and this is the cement that's bonding the cup to the bone. And this is the sort of Mexican hat because initially when they used to do the uh, the, the, the reaming um, of the acetabulum, they used to use a handheld reamer and they used to find the central point and anchor that down and then to uh, with, a, with a you know handheld device, they would they would ream out the the socket, and that would then fill that with a metal mesh, and that would be cemented in. So that was a little Mexican hat, and then this is the trochanteric osteotomy wiring because that's how we used to approach it through a, a trochanteric osteotomy, um, which which is not not really used anymore. Uh, but that's the approach that he used into the hip, um, and then he'd wire it back up, um, and that's what you'd see there. So. So that's all the components there of the of the Charlie Charlie hip. Now around the sort of same time, uh, you had other groups, and you know, famously the Exeter group, uh, led by Robin Ling and his engineer Clive Lee, um, working on um, the Exeter stem, uh, which is which actually follows a different type of um, philosophy to the Charlie stem. Um, as you can see, it's a uh, it's a double tapered design um, and it's shiny. So it's not matte finished like the Charlie stem. Um, and their argument was that the use of cement or cement itself, the properties, because it's a viscoelastic material, it's actually most, you know, greater strength under compression um, rather than a, you know, under 
stress, tensile stress if you pull it, or shearing. So the idea of a tempest stem is on weight bearing, you are tapering into the actual cement mantle. And you're allowed a bit of subsidence. So the extra stem is designed to um, you know, so subside um, a very small you know, amount of you know, 0.1 millimeters. But over the duration, you know, um, you can't have too much subsidence, but it's designed so that every time you weight bear, you anchor further into the cement. And this is called the taper slip concept, uh, as opposed to the composite beam, which was the, the concept that Charlie uh, followed with his um, with his stem. So you can see here that the Charlie stem, um, the, the the loading force when you load the stem, the load goes down and dissipates distally. So the problem was sometimes that you get this part of the femur would not be loaded that much. Um, and you get sort of stress shielding. So sometimes you get some wasting away of that bone um, and, and the distal anchorage uh, will mean that the, the, you know, the stem over time could fatigue because you may get movement at the top end, but fixation at the bottom end um, and you get fatigue failure of the stem. However, the exeter, the idea of the taper slip, um, such as the exeter stem, is that the force is dissipated equally throughout the length of the stem. Um, rather than just the, the distal part as in the Charlie. So two different concepts, they're coming from different angles. Um, and they're both sort of, you know, present at, at the same time. So the C stem itself um, actually, you know, is a, is a following from the Charlie stem, uh, which you can no longer really get hold of. And you can see over time that that's the, first generation of the Charlie. And then you had this um, very first C-STEM design um, introduced in 93. And then gradually over time, you saw this is the classic and then the latest is the AMT version. Um, and actually, interestingly enough, they've kind of gone to the, to the uh, um, taper slip design like the Exeter in terms of uh, concept. Uh, and left the composite beam concept. I mean, you still get other designs at the moment that do follow the composite beam, but the C stem, which is um, a further development of the Charlie, uh, has gone on to be a polished triple taper design um, because the Exeter is only a, a double taper. The C stem is a triple taper. The idea that it's tapered in all three planes um, to provide a bit more rotational stability. Uh, and there are there are other um, designs out there as well. Now, this is I alluded to this the Charlie pendulum. So he used to, uh, you know, demonstrate how good his implant is. His uh, setup was compared to uh, competitors. You know, he'd he'd set this up and then he'll get the pendulum swinging and then he'll he'll you know show everyone how um, his low frictional arthroplasty will will you know last a lot longer in terms of pendulum will continue to. Uh, to beat compared to the other ones, which will stop very quickly. Um, I've put this slide up just to sort of a background on um, where. So you can see here on the graph that femoral head size is quite key. Um, and you've got two types of wear. So you've got, got something called linear wear and volumetric wear. So linear wear is the amount of penetration through a material, and volumetric wear is dependent on the surface area. So the amount of surface area. Um, uh, um, where that happens so with, with a larger head obviously you get more volumetric wear and with a smaller head you get more linear wear and somewhere in the middle sort of 28 to 32 millimeter heads is thought to be the most ideal in terms of um, compromise between the two so with big heads you're thinking that really you know failure is due to uh, the amount of uh, you know, osteolysis from the polyethylene um, that's created because a lot of volume and the small head is more potentially through penetration through the material um, that could result to failure uh, and thinning of the material as you penetrate through it so just um, a little thought about that so just cover the evolution of cementing techniques so i mentioned pma and how charlie introduced it in 1958 um this actual the way of cementing has 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 drastically changed over time. 
So, you know, Charlie used to just use a bit of hand mixing and used to pack it in um, without preparing the canal or putting ephemeral restrictor on. He used to just pack it in with his thumb um, and then put put the, cement, uh, the actual stem in. Over time, the second generation, you have the introduction of the uh, cement restrictor, like the hardened restrictor here. You've got various different types on the market. And some surgeons actually use a bone block uh, rather than any, any of these materials. You've got a cement gun as well to help you pressurize the actual cement in the canal. So you've got a restrictor, you're able to pressurize and make sure you've got the cement, you know, interdigitates into the actual cancellous bone or in, into, into the bone so that you're getting a great anchorage. Um, but before that, you want to sort of brush and dry the, so you don't get any blood mixing in at the interface and uh, delaminating. Third generation introduced uh, vacuum mixing to reduce air bubbles in the cement so you don't get uh, problems with uh, um, crack propagation. Cement pressurization I spoke about using uh, these sort of you know triangular blocks in the proximal part. You may have seen people use that. And, and the introduction of pulse lavage, so you know, dry, you know, cleaning and um, washing out the canal really well. The fourth generation introduction of these centralizers distally uh, to to make sure the cement the, the stem is as central as possible in the canal. So we've spoken about um, cemented implants, um, but there are also uncemented implants that are present in the market. And obviously prior to Charlie, they, they were uncemented, but the concept of um, uncemented is you either have bone uh, ingrowth or bone on growth. So, um, the idea is you want to get primary stability by having bone uh, either in growing amongst all these little pores that you get in the, in, in the surface of the material. Um, and there are certain characteristics, you know, kind of porosity has to be about 40 to 50 percent. The pore sizes have to be within this sort of range to, um, to be, to, to be um, sufficient, um, allowing bone to grow and incorporate into the surface because that way you'll get then will all act as one and you get primary stability you won't get any micro motion because if you do get micro motion you then unfortunately never develop stability you never get bone too much motion you'll end up with fibrous tissue and then you can get into parent strain theory and all that kind of stuff which is beyond the scope, uh, scope of this talk but um bone on growth different um slightly different in that you have sort of you know, peaks and valleys in the material and the idea is that the bone on, grows onto this surface such as you know hydroxyapatite um, needs for a certain thickness so you have no pores but you only have divots in the surface and the idea is it grows in and out and it creates a friction in that sur in that surface to prevent the motion again achieving primary stability by that means there are different implants that are available uh, especially for revision uh, surgery so you have um, you know different types of uh, an amount of uh, coverage of, of these materials to achieve what I've just spoken about um, but the idea is to achieve prime stability um, with all these all these implants and there are these two ways of, of, of achieving that so you can see down here this is a socket also with like an augment again made of this porous material and it's sort of to achieve anchorage into acetabulum. Acetabular components, again, um, several different types. You can see here, you've got the same thing I just spoke about. Some have got holes in them and you can put screws in as well and that provides sort of secondary stability into the bone. So as well as getting the uh, ingrowth or ongrowth, uh, you, you can also achieve extra stability using screws. Uh, that's the example uh, there. Um, this is a picture of uh, what we call augments. So sometimes if you've got a bit of a bony defect, you can use these um, sockets, but you may be left with a bit of a defect. So you've got an option of, of using uh, these little metal triangular uh, sizes of different size. You know, it depends on the defect size. You can then anchor that into it with a screw. And this is made of the same sort of porous material. Um, and again, that will allow incorporation to host bone. Here I've put examples of um, what we call, uh, so the, 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 these are components of bipolar um, or um, articulations within articulations, if you like. So you can see that this is the shell that anchors into the socket. 
then you've got plastic poly that can articulate within that shell and then you've got the femoral head that articulates within that one so um these are great for you know used for patients who have problems with stability or risk of dislocation um people who you know have got uh, muscle deficiency or um nerve injuries or weakness or even patients who've had revision surgery and uh, you know there may be increased risk of getting dislocations and this is an option where you you're increasing the amount of movement so there's two sort of articulations um so to dislocate this you know takes a significant amount of force uh to to do that i've also put here um for more complex um cases you can see that uh, these are sort of triflange custom made implants and some patients particular revision uh, not so much in uh, primary replacements but in revision replacements you sometimes face with a problem of significant bone loss um, where you don't really have a socket and on top of that the type of bone around it may be very weak and this is like a heat map that um, with a CT scan uh, you can um, identify areas of bone that are of good quality and bones that are not good quality uh, where you won't achieve anchorage. So the idea here, for example, with this kind of implant is that you've got the socket and then you've got this sort of triflange, sort of three anchor points that you can then um, secure into whatever bone is left in that semi-pelvis, uh, that's in the ilium pubis initium. Um, and then you can cement into this actual this is almost like you're creating your socket if you're like your native acetabulum, and then you can put your implant into that. So this is a triflange or custom made. You, know, you get a CT scan, uh, work out the defect, um, and then you can reconstruct it. So this is way far, you know, far down the construction ladder. Um, but these are just flavors I've just put out in terms of what's what's out there for the acetabular components. Femoral heads. Um, so your typical metal on metal, so cobalt chrome metal heads. Um, you've also got your ceramic heads, and yes, this is the ceramic heads. Obviously, more expensive than the cobalt chrome metal heads. Um, some surgeons use you know ceramic heads for younger patients because um, it's got better wear characteristics, durability, um, last longer, etc. While the you know, for, for an older patient, you may argue that you know they don't need to hip last as long. So you could argue you're know, using something cheaper like a cobalt or a chrome metal head. Um, the ceramic head itself has gone through uh, three generations of change over time. There were problems with brittleness initially, fracturing, um, but over time um the way it's made has been substantially improved, uh, has made it more durable, still brittle, of course, as a ceramic is the material. Um, and the main problem really is uh, fracturing, uh, particularly with acetabular, with, with acetabular liners. Uh, if they're not quite seated properly um, or the, the, the acetabular uh, component is ma uh, malaligned, then you can create a lot of stress on a particular point uh, and that can that can make it prone to to to, to fracturing um the other thing i've added here uh some of you may or may not be aware of is is the sort of scratch profile so when you scratch a metal you get uh, this v shape you also get these little spikes in the surface um and that roughens the surface as a result so that could then increase the roughness and possible wear um, of the softer material, which in most cases would be the poly. However, the ceramic scratch, you get a smoother and not such a rough, peaky um, uh, outline. So the scratch profile of a ceramic is much better than that of a metal uh, head. There is something else called oxonium head, um, which is a metal head, but uh, the surface is undergone transition to a ceramic uh, under sort of immense pressure and heat has become a ceramic surface it's almost like a best of both worlds but it is obviously very expensive so probably not best of both worlds in the sense that it's not as cheap as the metal head 
Um, but it, it, you know, it's 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 an exciting option, um, becoming more and more common. Um, data still young, um, but promising, as I say. So, you know, that's also an option. So you may have come across uh, the use of oxonium heads in hip replacement. Just touch a little bit upon um, templating and pre-op planning. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, it's quite important to be able to um, look at an X-ray uh, and understand what you're looking at. When you come to operate on these patients, it's also useful to have an idea before you go in uh, with a you know with a plan, so you know kind of what potential component sizes you need, um, you know any anatomy abnormalities that you need to consider intraoperatively. Um, you want to make sure that you are when you're operating on a patient and you've got the hip open and you're preparing the femur or the socket, you want to ensure that you're templating similar to what you're seeing. You know, you're not a million miles off, you know, the size is not a million miles off. Um, templating is not 100%, but it's a useful guide um, for the surgeon to appreciate the patient's anatomy, the offset we spoke about, the leg length discrepancy, you know, how far do you need to put your stem in? Um, how, far, how far do you need to sink your socket in? Um, all those things need to be considered. And pre-op templating is a nice little sort of warm up, I guess, so you kind of know what to you know, what to expect when you go in. So this is just an example. Um, there is the this is the king marker. There's there's also this little ball. Um, there's different different things on the market. The king marker is thought to be fairly accurate because it sort of takes into account, um, you know, these uh, lines and and balls and it the software automatically calculates the amount of magnification uh, to give you uh, an accurate estimate. Um, here you can see that, you know, I've drawn sort of a line for teardrop to identify where I am. I've previously marked out you know, your leg length. So you need to work out if the leg's short or long on that side, position of your socket, um, and you want to recreate the patient's natural offset. So you want to... Um, ensure that the rotation you know the central rotation is recreated um and you know little things like the the, the depth of the stem how far you need to put it in uh some pa some surgeons mark out the uh, neck cut how far from the lesser trochanter so various little things that different surgeons might do um so yeah this is a little bit on on templating that's obviously a 2d templating so it's not 100 percent you know ultimately C you know, uh, 3d ct templating is even better if you really want to get uh, more technical. So, you know, how, how do we how do we monitor um, how implants are, are doing? And um, for us, obviously, you may have heard about is the, the NGR, the National Joint Registry. Um, uh, for hips and knees, it started in April 2003. Um, so this year, sort of the 20th anniversary. Uh, however, submissions weren't compulsory up until April 2011, believe it or not. Um, but other other countries were sort of ahead of us. You know, the Scandinavians uh, really good at keeping a record of, uh, of of implants, and and actually uh, they're the ones that brought to light the problem with the metal on metal total hip placements, the ASR. So you know they flagged up the fact that these were failing early, um, and and it then became a uh, international news and. And that, that's the important thing about the about joint registry is that it identifies how implants are doing. Um, are there any early are there any early failures? Um, because you have got to know that as a surgeon when you come to consent a patient, you've got to tell the patients how what implants you're using. You know why these implants? You know why they've been chosen. And I'll come on to that in a second. But the, this is the latest from the NGR, so you can see that uh, over time. Um, things are largely uh, static. So the Exeter, this is the type of stems that have been used. The Exeter is the most commonest used uh, by far. You've got the the orange one here is a CPT. Uh, the blue one here, you've got the C stem that I spoke about. So the CPT is another uh, type of stem. Um, there's a slight overlap and one's overtaking the other and then the rest is sort of uh, very similar. 
the the bearing surface so you can see that uh, this blip is just during during covid but overall the by far the commonest is the metal head with a poly uh, socket and um uh, over time um the ceramic on poly is actually uh, increasing in usage so it's now reached a stage where you know, the ceramic on poly is more commonplace than a metal on uh, poly and uh, um and actually ceramic on ceramic is um is sort of going down uh, and that's probably you know these numbers i suspect are just added to to this number while the metal on on poly probably continue to be at the same sort of um numbers that have been putting in um metal on metal is down here it's always been very very low and continues to be so um but you can see here interesting ceramic on poly um is going up in numbers the type of um configuration so cemented where both the socket and the stem um cemented in um you can see that um that sort of going down uh as compared to hybrid which is sort of uh, equally going up uh in frequency so the hybrids where the the socket is uncemented and the stem is cemented um and the the reverse hybrid which is not on here is the opposite uh cementless so again numbers are fairly sort of static and where both components are uncemented and the resurfacing is is, is minimal so um odep rating so this is this is looking at how that's what in what and what odep stands for is orthopedic data evaluation panel so this is a group of independent uh, panel of experts, uh, clinical, non-clinical, um, have experienced the orthopedic industry and decide um, the rating of individual implants. And this is dependent on, you know, the numbers that, that are out there, uh, how well uh, they're doing from the NGR data. And you can see here, um, and, you know, the available research uh, on these implants as well. So the different rating depends on, so if you look at the maximum revision rate, for, so, so this is the number of years, there's data on an implant. So for, for an implant, that's 13 years, uh, follow-up can't have more than a 6.5% uh, revision rate uh, at 13 years. And that would be given, um, given, given that 13A rating. Um, so that's just a little guy, so you can kind of, explain to patients you know whether you're putting in a, a 10a rating a 7a rating or a 13a rating uh, component um what the data is out there to support the use of this component what's the long-term uh data say the revision rates the failure rates you know all, all these kind of um little little bits of information that are important when you come to uh choose implants and consent patients because they will potentially ask you for why using this implant not this one um and the star ratings, like you know, addition, you know, beyond compliance, basically where product um, is, you know, where where it is. Now, this is examples of, of different components that have got thirteen A star rating. Uh, you know, your your Exeter stem, the, the cup. Um, you've got the marathon cup here, and you've got the uncemented uh, pinnacle. You've got the Karai uncemented stem as well. So. You know, these are sort of ODEP 13A star rating. But it's important to know that if if um, an implant is made of more than one component, then it may be that that actual makeup, the ODEP rating for that makeup will be um, will be at the at the lowest. Uh, if one of the components is at seven A star rating, for example, ODEP rating, then the whole thing will have a seven A star. ODEP rating, uh, even if if another component or another part had a thirteen A star rating, so so it, it, it you know it depends on the the component with the lowest ODEP rating. So uh, a little bit of flavour. So just sort of um, summarising what we've covered and what 
what things are. So you can see that uh, this patient's bilateral tight hip placement, so they've got an uncemented um, cup on both sides. On this side, they've used screws to augment, provide a bit of secondary stability. Um, both sides, you've got uh, uncemented um, calcar bearing uh, components. You can see this little calcar bearing on both sides here. Um, this patient, uh, unfortunately, has got a, a failing acetabular component. You can see that there's a bit of lysis around uh, the socket. The socket looks a bit more vertical as well. Um, so now it's not the same patient, but um, with this one, for example, on this side, um, this patient's had a revision operation, so they've got an Exeter stem here. Um, they've got a, a cup. They've also got this uh, very large... Um, metal augment and buttress and this and this is and these are used when you have significant bone loss um, in revision surgery uh, typically uh, you then need to use those augments that I showed you earlier um, to fill any defects this patient's got an even crazier uh, acetabulum you can see that sort of tri-flange um, uh, component I, I spoke about earlier all these screws going in multiple directions to try and get as much purchase and all the good bone that's available um, and, and you know again these are sort of reconstruction options uh, and revision operations I didn't quite cover resurfacing hip replacements but that's one Birmingham hip resurfacing is the most uh, popular one uh, that's no longer really uh, used put in very rarely in very select cases uh, very select centres um, but that's that's resurfacing here on this side this is a metal on metal so you see a large head uh, total hip replacement um, and this case is quite interesting because if you look carefully you can see some extensive lysis uh, in, 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 in the pelvis there and also the proximal femur so this patient's awaiting um, major revision surgery on this side um, a joint case with the pelvic team because you can imagine that there's a substantial risk of bone loss here when you remove this component uh, you may not be left very much. So reconstruction options are going to be quite tough. Um, but that's the problem metal on metal. You get you know, soft tissue and bone resorption. Uh, and, and you're not left with very much uh, to, to kind of reconstruct. So that's a metal on metal total hip placement. Um, some patients, so this is like a, a capture cup or constrained liner, so you've got where patients are at risk of dislocating, so you've got an option of trying to reduce that risk. Um, with this, you could just subtly see there's like a ring, uh, the base of the uh, base of the socket. I didn't give that as an example earlier. Now, um, from the femoral side of things, you can see that uh, some patients, you know, this is the original Charlie in, and over time things have loosened. Um, and you know the amount of bone stock around here once you take the stem out um, is, is very dubious, um, and you know can easily sort of fall away. And and unfortunately, you know patients that have not got much bone stock here to reconstruct to give you some options from a revision point of view. You know you'd be looking at sort of proximal femoral replacement like this, where you you just have unfortunately cut away uh, that proximal uh, part of the femur and, and throw it away and, and give them this. Um, giant lump of metal um that uh you know to, to, to give them some function this uh, this patient down here again this is a femoral revision stem um and you know they would have had their all component removed uh due to due to uh, loosening and failure um and this is a very different type of stem that is uncemented that i spoke to you about earlier uh, and it purchases um in, in the diaphysis uh, in here now these these are um these are cables. Uh, sometimes you put prophylactic cables to prevent any fracturing, uh, but I don't know exactly about this case in particular whether there was a, a break here that they had to cable. But this is this is a revision sort of stem um, to address uh, problems on the femoral side. So in terms of advancements, so you know you probably more than familiar or heard about. Um, I mean, there's always been uh, navigation, but now more and more in orthopedics in arthroplasty surgery. There's the introduction of robotics or the use of robotic surgery. At the moment, I think it's probably more so in, in uh, knee replacement, but it's it's coming more commonplace in, in uh, helping out in hip replacements, more so on the acetabular side. So the placement of the socket, uh, so the idea of the ro robot is it helps you 
uh, with CD plan with with um, uh, uh, CT planning uh, to like you know single single ream single preparation of the socket in the exact position where you want it to be um, the exact angle and inclination etc to then place the uncemented component um, on the femoral side there's no real benefit from a robotics point of view at the moment that might that might change but at the moment that's not that's not really it, it's uh, it's used it's mainly on the on the acetabulum side. Uh, AI, of course, um, we all know about AI and how it's it's been used increasingly uh, in the world around us, and it's going to become more commonplace um, in orthopedics. It's, we're already coming across it using it, you know, reading X-rays and identifying fracture lines and, and things like that. So, you know, it's going to become more uh, more commonplace. Maybe the use of algorithms may even be templating uh, might automatically template something for you and tell you the most ideal position, etc. So. You know, I'm sure that will come in. Um, Patient-specific implants and uh, and 3D templating and use of CD uh, uh, um, CT uh, software to do that for you. So some patients may have awkward uh, anatomy um, from previous childhood deformities or previous fractures or you know all that kind of stuff that makes um, the use of uh, off-the-shelf stems very difficult. Um, and you may therefore be uh, looking at uh, using custom-made um, implants to fit the patient's anatomy. So, you know, um, stems that are um, that are angled or bent to one direction, et cetera. Obviously, these are all within range, We're all within limits. So when these are engineered, uh, they are then put through software to ensure that they don't fail prematurely, et cetera. There's no point giving a, a patient a femoral stem that's ideal for their anatomy, but they're ultimately, you know, it may fail because of the design and the amount of forces it, it copes with, etc. So it's all within, all has to be within uh, uh, limits and is extensively uh, tested. Uh, but here a little bit on 3D printing and, and the use of 3D uh, printers so at the moment, right? And so we quite commonly uh, get 3D printed models uh, of uh, anatomy that's very difficult. It just gives you a nice, um, uh, overview of the anatomy um, and you're able to part of your pre-op planning you can appreciate any bone loss um, and, and cut, you can even do dry runs so you can even um, using these you can ream into them you can uh, cement components see your so the uh, um, component orientation as well so it gives you almost like a uh, a mock mock setup of the real thing so it can be very useful and um, day case arthroplasty. So this is becoming um, more and more of a hot topic. Uh, a lot of centers are driving forward to try and um, further improve the patient experience, trying to get patients operated on, or optimized, operated on, manage their post-op pain relief in an efficient manner, get their physiotherapy um done efficiently and and you know out the same day if not potentially um out this uh, you know the following day so there's there's a greater greater push to further improve uh you know the the enhanced recovery gone the days of when charlie did an operation where patients would be in bed for two weeks um you know without moving you know with the idea of they need to be staying in bed for everything to heal up and then they move then we've gone to more recently the enhanced recovery where patients you know would be amazed you know that out by day three and four now we're pushing that even further and we're going towards day case surgery so you know forever, forever trying to push um push push that boundary so um that's the that's the end of the um presentation thank you very much mo that's really wonderful uh, thanks for taking us through this uh hip replacement history biomechanics uh, advancements wonderful again good revision of the topic yeah. excellent uh, um, Jay, if you would like to go through the mcqs if possible just uh, we can um yeah that would be that would be fine i've got three so yeah. um Oh, let's get rid of that. So um, we can start with with this one. So um, what was John was John Charlie best known for? So 
Um, the use of large femoral heads to reduce the risk of dislocations, or did he introduce the taper slip stem design, or coming up with a low frictional um, torque arthroplasty concept, or using uncemented femoral stems? So what was he best known for? Okay, guys, uh, just try to put your answers. Number three, majority going for number three. Fantastic. Yeah, good. So I've been listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how do uncemented components achieve hold in, in, in host bone? So um, is it through the use of uh, cement? Do we, do we rely on in growth or on growth on the bone um, through the action of the surrounding fibrous tissue? or through the use of screws. And we have here option number two, majority yeah. going for number two. Yeah, fantastic. So as we covered earlier, so that's so your primary stability. So three screws is your secondary stability. And obviously you want to avoid your formation of fibrous tissue because that's, you know, that's not going to achieve any form of stability. Um, so in addition to magnification markers, uh, how should a pre-op radiograph be taken to facilitate templating? So what's the ideal position? So do you center on the hips or the legs and 15 degrees of external rotation? Or should you have uh, center, center on the hips or the legs and 15 degrees of internal rotation, some slight flexion? Or do you center on the hips with legs and 15 degrees of internal rotation, a slight abduction? Or do you center on the hips with 15 degrees of internal rotation to account for the natural 15 degrees of femoral antiversion. So they are going for option four. Fantastic. Very good. So that's, uh, we've been listening to some Excellent. of that stuff as well. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much, uh, Mo, for going through this um, very interesting lecture on hip replacement again. Um, that was wonderful. You're welcome, no problem. Yeah, I think uh, you covered everything and it was a very nice, a wonderful recap of this uh, subject. So thank you very much again, uh, Mr. Sultani, for joining.